wow, this is a bit of a shrinkage compared to yesterday. What's wrong? It's already pretty early in the term to be running mad about assignments and I should get this All right, so today I'll talk about virtualization. What is it? Why? How does it work? Why do we need it? And um, what are the modern architecture support mechanisms for it? This will set the scene for talking about how virtualization relates to microkernels later in the term. So today is pretty much not about microkernels, but only about virtualization hypervisors and the hardware to support them. All right. So what is virtualization? Virtualization is about running things in a virtual machine rather than a physical machine. And what's a virtual machine? This is the classic definition from the paper on virtualization back in the 70s. This is again, everything conceptual has been invented in the 60s or 70s. Virtualization is no different. It's actually older than microkernels. So the, the classic Hobbit and Goldberg definition of virtualization is uh, a virtual machine is an efficient, isolated duplicate of a real machine. So there's a number of operational terms in there, duplicate. This means it's functionally equivalent to the physical machine. So it should behave like it. Obviously, there is a, in theory, a program should not be able to distinguish between running on a virtual or physical machine. In practice, that's unachievable, but you can approximate it. Um, there, there are some differences. For example, the virtual machine may not have the same resources as the physical machine. Um, these days, with the way hardware is being virtualized, that tends not to be an issue, um, but you definitely see timing differences. And timing, given that the timing is inherently different from physical machine, that means you're always, almost always able to tell. Certainly once you have a device driver that interacts with a, with a real world as devices do, then you can't really completely maintain the virtualization illusion. But you can approximate it pretty well. So the duplicate is one thing, that's the functional requirement. And the isolated one is as important. So the, that's the idea of you can have multiple virtual machines on the same physical machine and they're isolated from each other. Each thinks it's living in its own universe. Does that sound familiar to you in some way? Like no, not really a microkernel. Huh? Not necessarily even multi-core. I, I like a virtual this way. Yeah, uh, exactly. A process has some of these properties, right? Processes are isolated and each has the illusion of operating in its own universe. Of course, that's achieved by some form of virtualization. You can you can only do this with virtual memory. So but processes um, rely on at least properly isolated process in that sense rely on virtualization of the memory resource. The, a virtual machine does a more complete job of um, virtualizing things. And efficient, and this is what makes the whole thing useful, usable. If the, the virtual machine was not efficient, then no one would, or hardly anyone would use it. So that means that the virtual machine should execute at a uh, performance that is comparable to the physical machine. You won't typically completely match it, of course, but um, you want to have a reasonably close performance. And in order to achieve that, you basically need to execute most instructions natively. This is sort of an immediate consequence, right? If you virtualizing means somehow interpreting the actions that the virtual machine executes, and that means fundamentally interpreting virtualizing instructions. But if you do that for every instruction, then the overhead will be massive. So core to virtual machine is being able to run most instructions natively on the machine. And obviously 
because this is an, a software abstraction, there's a software layer that implements it, and that's the virtual machine monitor or hypervisor. The two terms are mostly used interchangeably. Um, basically, hypervisor came out of the IBM world and virtual machines out of elsewhere. For a long time, IBM had their own terminology for everything different from the rest of the world. It's no longer the case, but the hypervisor term survives. It's a, it's a nice term. Um, we will then see later in sort of more mo modern approaches to virtual machines um, that, that you can then get to make a distinction between hypervisors and um, virtual machine monitors certainly in a microkernel context, but I'm not going to talk about that today. All right, so that's the, the fundamental idea. And then there's different ways to virtualize things. And these correspond to different interfaces in a system. So you have hardware-software interfaces. This is where things get virtualized traditionally. This is what's called the so-called platform virtualization when we virtualize at the hardware-software interface. And the hardware-software interface, that's the instruction set architecture, of course. right? So, and what you get there is then the platform VM or system VM and um, where you have a hypervisor running between your operating system and the processor and you can have multiple virtual machines running on that hypervisor each with their own operating system application stack etc you're aware of any examples of this one you have plenty around what are typical hypervisors doing this virtual box um that's actually not one of those <laughs> That's the, the other case, the type 2, where the hypervisor runs on an operating system as an application. So VirtualBox is one of these examples, or Parallels on Mac, etc. Um, VMware, VMware Server is an instance of a type 1 hypervisor. VMware also has a workstation product, VMware Workstation, which is a type 2. Um, Zen is a well-known example of a type 1 KVM, etc. So this, the typical things that are deployed on clouds. Okay, um, So both of these in the, virtualize on the hardware-software interface. The one is just basically makes the hypervisor the, the core of the system, whereas the, in the type 2, the hypervisor runs on top of another operating system and there could be other apps running besides it. But then there's other places where you can virtualize, or really where you can intercept things. One is the operating system API, where you present multiple operating systems environment, which looks like each of them being an, a, an operating system by themselves. So then you have a virtualization on top of the operating system with processes running on top. Any ideas of examples of that one? Yes, that would be an example of that, uh, the Windows subsystem on um, Linux. Um, other examples? Java? Java? Nope, Java is the next one. <laughs> um, containers, Docker is a typical example of that, right? You, you, base, you virtualize at the OS API level. And then Java is the third case where you virtualize at the process level. And this gives you so-called process virtual machines. So Java.net and things like that are examples of that one. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of these. I'm only talk about platform virtualization. And um, these days, people call virtualization everything virtualization because it's a cool term. Um, how things go right but as I said we're going to focus on the uh, platform virtualization in particular the type 1 uh, mentioned type 2 a, a little bit down the way um, track but it's mostly about type 1 so really virtualizing at the hardware software interface as uh, the, by the hypervisor running on the bare hardware okay so why did people invent virtual machines? Remember, this goes back to the 70s. So let's not talk about the modern uses yet, quite yet, but sort of why would people invent this concept of virtual machines back in the 70s? Was it to emulate other machines? 
Machine emulation? No, that wasn't a driver. This is sort of a more modern use. QEMU is an example of that, right? They often call that a virtual machine. It's really an emulator. Um, so this was, remember, 70s or even 60s. That was the early days of computing, where basically an operating system was really mostly there for input-output management, a bit of machine abstraction, and um, providing very rudimentary services. And the operating systems of those days were basically single user, single tasking systems. So the OS was just there to load the process, provide some services to it. Isolation wasn't a part of the deal. And then as machines grew more powerful, that was a very wasteful approach. You had this really expensive mainframes. They cost millions of dollars in 1970s money, which is zillions of dollars these days. Um, and just running a single application on, the, on that machine was not a good resource usage. Once they have enough resources, that more resources than a single process would use. For example, when a process would do I.O., then it would be stalled, the expensive CPU would do nothing, etc. So that was a motivation for time sharing. But of course, time sharing was obviously a good way to get better utilization of the resource, but you didn't have the operating systems to do it. So Oppie's idea, in hindsight, is, well, we put a hypervisor underneath, which just multiplexes the hardware, the, the resources, between these single process um, operating systems, and then you get much more efficient use of the hardware, right? Obviously, this use case pretty much went away within 10 years after that, when people started building proper multitasking operating systems, and you don't need this anymore. And unsurprising, virtualization went mostly out of um, fashion, IBM still used virtualization throughout. Any re you know why? Yeah, IBM supported at these days um, three or four different operating systems. <laughs> and um, they tried to merge them all on the same hardware platforms, etc. Uh, but keep their customer base that were dependent on the particular operating system. So they use virtualization to support multiple operating systems on the same platform. Um, but beyond that, virtualization became mostly obsolete in the 80s. And then it became, it was rediscovered in the 90s and became really popular this century. So what was the driver for that? So the, the one was sort of related to why IBM kept using it throughout. People wanted to use multiple operating systems, so typically running both Windows and Linux on the same platform, that's a good use case for a hypervisor. Um, but also, people found interesting reasons for using virtualization, which basically had to do with shortcomings of the operating systems. Um, one thing is that and that's even still true today, mainstream operating systems are generally pretty hopeless in providing proper isolation. Uh, they're insecure, get hacked, right? You have hundreds of CVEs against both Linux and Windows. Um, their resource isolation is almost non-existent. You can really run um, efficient denial of service attacks in these mainstream oper mainline operating systems against other applications, etc. And people, I remember this very well when we sort of in CSE started to basically dis in, uh, integrate things. So for a while you got more uh, powerful hardware, so you kept multiple services on the same platform. And then we and lots of people around the world realized, well, if we run our web server, oh, no, that was before the web, our mail server and our file server on the same physical machine, then whenever the file system gets really busy, our mail doesn't really keep, keep up with um, traffic. And so people then started to put servers onto dedicated machines again, basically because the resource management in the operating systems was broken. And so then 
the next thing is okay now you have you keep replicating hardware you get poor hardware utilization etc so in a way coming back to the original use case for virtual machines and this is why things really started taking off um, really shortcomings of operating systems but what really then happened was the clouds so the driver for clouds was that well, if everyone wants their own computing center, that's very inefficient. In average, you have to provision for maximum usage, but in aver your average usage is much less than the maximum. So you get an average really poor resource utilization. Everyone needs to have competent system admins to um, administer those systems. That's very expensive. It's much easier to do this by scale. And so that's the basic use case for clouds. So instead of every company running their own compute center with multiple machines. You have a centralized service that provides virtual machines to do the same job. And you get very skilled system management and very good resource utilization and can drive the cost down overall. So that, that's really the driver of the cloud and the modern driver for virtualization. Virtualization is really key to cloud services. Okay. Um, so, after this motivation, how does it work? So fundamentally, as I said, we are talking about system or platform VMs where we virtualize at the ISA, the hardware software interface. We have um, <coughs> hardware and operating system. They interact via a interface specification, which is the ISA. And so we can put a hypervisor in between and in this traditional virtualization, the hypervisor runs an unmodified guest OS, which means it has to, its API, this is software, so it has an API, should really be API, sorry, um, towards the guest OS is the same as the ISA, it's the hardware software interface, which is not necessarily the, the most efficient software interface, which we'll, we'll get to that later. And then it um, mediates access to resources and switches between between those guest virtual machines. So the, the hypervisor basically schedules those virtual machines and then switches between them. That's called a world switch. And um, the implication of that is the hypervisor needs to be more privileged than the guest. So the core requirement there is the operating system no longer runs in privileged mode of the hardware. So this is traditional model where we only have two modes of execution, privileged and unprivileged. So we need to deprivilege the guest operating system, otherwise it could mess with the, with the resources, right? You can only have complete control over the resource if you're the only thing that's running in privileged mode, because anything that runs in privileged mode can re mess with resource allocation. So the key here is the ability to deprivilege the operating system in order to uh, implement this virtual machine abstraction. And the way to do that is by relying on most instructions being harmless and just being able to execute, but then the ones that access privileged state, they need to trap into the hypervisor so that the hypervisor can keep take control and emulate whatever the guest OS um, was trying to attempt, as long as it's legal, or hit it on a um, heavily over the knuckles with um, if it does if it tries to do something illegal right? um, and then um, yeah okay so what are the implications of that we have an application which runs on an operating system and it obtains OS services how does it obtain an, a service from the operating system Yes, and what does a syscall, what, what is a syscall? Instruction hmm? Instruction on the CPU. Yeah, and what's particular about that instruction? It doesn't even have to be a specific instruction. You can have hardware that doesn't have a syscall instruction. Is it interrupt? Hmm? Interrupt? Not an interrupt, but an exception. <coughs> so you need to, in order to end up the operating system, the application causes a trap of some sort, right? And that um, invokes the exception handler on the operating system, and that can then do whatever the application requested or not do if it was an illegal attempt. So in order for the application to get an, a service from the operating system, 
It traps in the OS, the OS does something and then returns. Now, how does that happen in the case of a virtual machine? If the app runs in a virtualized environment on top of a guest OS that runs on top of a hypervisor. So the app does is unmodified, as the guest OS is. So it just executes and then executes its syscall trap. What happens with that? So basically it gets trapped by it has to trap into the hypervisor because the hypervisor is the privileged software. And what does the hypervisor do? Well, the hypervisor needs to obviously analyze what kind of trap it is. Assuming it was a syscall destined for the guest OS, it needs to reflect it back up, right? And then the guest OS does its thing, and then it needs to return to the user. How does it do that? How does the OS return back to an application? Well, no, it, there, there's typically a return from exception instruction, right? We, we enter the system through some exception and then there is a, an instruction that basically returns back to user state. Now in this case, what happens there? That's again a privileged instruction, right? So it needs to trap back into the hypervisor and then the hypervisor needs to reflect that back up into the app. So we get this kind of code. Does that look familiar to anyone? It looks like what we're doing is SDL4. It looks very much what we do in a microkernel, right? When you invoke a system service, and it's actually similar. So there's a lot of um, similarities between hypervisors and microkernel. As I said, I won't discuss that today, but um, sometime in a, later in the term. So this is a type one hypervisor. If we have the hosted hypervisor, what happens there? The app traps and where do we end up? In the host OS, right? And the host OS sends it up to the hypervisor, sends it up to the guest, blah, blah, blah. So you have this double W. Um, and that basically tells you why a hosted virtual machine is much less efficient than a bare metal virtual machine. Not only because of the increased number of node switches, but also the hypervisor is really optimized for that job. That's its purpose in life, is to redirect these exceptions between the um, guest OS and the application. The host OS, if you think of Linux, how does it do that? How does it reflect these um, traps up to the hypervisor or the app? You can't just use, like for the first transition, it can't just, oh, this has changed. Ah. For the first transition upwards, it can't just use uh, the return from exception instruction because that would get it back into the app, right? So it has to like call it Well, I mean, it, it probably uses the return from exception somehow, but it actually needs to manipulate state to get to the right point of the hypervisor rather than the user. Um, and the hypervisor, but, but what, what are the mechanisms, if you think of Linux, for doing this sort of stuff? For receiving an exception and then handling it somehow? at user level, because this is really what happens here, right? We basically, the hypervisor is now a user level exception handler, which needs to be invoked by the guest. What's the mechanism in Linux for doing that? Signals, right? Now, if you compare the cost of signals in Linux to a system call, say, in SEO4, you'll find there's easily an order of magnitude in between because this is not something the Linux model or the Unix model or Windows model is optimized for. So this is actually the bigger effect on performance you typically get for, from um, type two hypervisors. Okay, so we get overheads from increased number of mode switches and system calls, but as I argued with the microkernel case, this can be actually kept pretty low um, if, if you know what you're doing, but for the hyper, for the hosted case, that's pretty hopeless. Okay, so this is sort of very high level view of what happens. How does this happen in reality? So 
how does in, uh, hypervisor emulate instructions? There, basically, it, as I said, it's all by traps. So these traps can be system calls directed to the guest, but if the kernel, the, op, the guest operating system itself does privileged operations that need to be emulated by the hypervisor, then it's more complex. It's not just a syscall trap, right? Because the guest presumably runs unmodified, it's an unmodified guest binary, and it just does normal operations as it does, for example, um, managing page tables, playing with privileged CPU state, etc. And that traps into the hypervisor. So for example, here, the, um, the guest tries to access a privileged register, that's the address space ID register of the CPU, which is part of the MMU. And that's privileged state, so it traps in the hypervisor. And then the hypervisor has an emulation of that state. So it has somewhere in a, a virtual machine control block, which points to the register context of the guest operating system. And then it loads the wherever the emulation value of this ACID register lives, the virtual ACID register, and operates on that, and then returns back to the guest. So this one instruction now blows out into several instructions. Of course, this is only the core. This doesn't include the exception handling coming in, interpreting what the exception actually is, etc., and then uh, uh, cleaning up state and before returning to the user. So typically, this is not just three instructions. This is dozens of instructions. So emulating each one of these instructions is relatively costly. And this comes back to what I said earlier. The whole thing only works because most of the instructions can just execute natively, and you only have to ex um, intercept the uh, privileged instructions, the one that deal with privileged machine state, which the hypervisor needs to control fully. So most instructions don't trap, and that, that allows us to do efficient virtualization. But the corollary of that is also true that all the critical instructions, the one that deal with privileged state, they must trap. So the most instructions don't trap is a requirement for performance, that the, the ones, the instructions that deal with privileged state do trap is a requirement for doing this virtualization in the first place. So this is what's called the trap and emulate requirements. Um, we distinguish between privileged instructions and innocu innocuous instructions. So a privileged instruction is one that um, modifies or accesses privileged state and everything else is innocuous instruction. So these are the ones that can just execute natively. And between in the among the privileged instructions, there is also distinguished between instructions that um, actually modify privileged state, which is obviously something that needs to be reserved by the hypervisor, and those which only access privileged state, so the one is called the control um, sensitive and the others are the behavior sensitive. So the behavior sensitive instruction needs to be virtualized in order to maintain the complete illusion of virtualization. It's not it, it, it can't mess with resource allocation, but it can learn things about other virtual machines, etc. So both need to be um, trapping. And the definition of a trap and emulate virtualizable hardware is that all these privileged instructions actually do trap. And it's not enough for them to be no-ops. And this is a, a problem traditionally with Intel architectures that a lot of in privileged instructions when executed at user level, they just are ignored by the hardware. Of course, if, if that happens, then the hardware can, the, the virtual, the hypervisor doesn't get invoked and you can't really implement this virtual machine abstraction. So also it's important to understand that some instructions are inherently um, sensitive. So if you change any of the machine state register, for example, that these are special instructions, they are privileged, they need to trap. But other instructions, for other instructions, it depends on what state they operate. So normal load store operations, load store instructions, in most cases, they're obviously innocuous, but if you try to write to the page table, then it's a privileged operation and it needs to trap. 
And of course, the reason this is doable is because the page tables are live in privileged state, they are kernel protected and trying to access them will trap. So that's uh, ensured by that. So this gets us to the uh, definition of what's called trap and virtualizable hardware when it, all privileged instructions are, all sensitive instructions are privileged, so they trap. Um, and once, if we have that, then we can just take a unmodified binary, OS binary, and run it on our virtual machine. Any questions up to this point? Okay. This is really core cool to understanding everything, this slide and the previous one. So if you have any questions, please ask them now. Good. So this is pretty much what people did when they talked about virtualization in the past. Um, then they soon found out, well, there's um, efficiency challenges. Can we do it better? And this leads then to what's called impure virtualization, or the more, more modern term is para virtualization, where you actually then modify the guest operating system in order to get a more efficient virtualization. And so, an example of this one um, we have a process of status register, which of course is a privileged state because it contains the mode bit that tells where the internal user state and it typically contains interrupt mask and all that stuff. Um, so, accessing this is obviously privileged, and the guest operating system may will access that one. And normally, that means yes, you would trap into the kernel, into the hypervisor, and do the emulation. Um, but there's more efficient ways to do that because something like the process of status register, the, the virtual machine view of this process of status register is in general quite different from the hypervisor view or the, the actual hardware view of this. And it's very easy to emulate it with a bit of software at user level. So, um, or, so, so one way to, uh, yeah, I, I was doing it in the wrong order. So we can do it at user level by just saying, okay, we need to, we have an emulation of this that is done in a library, say, where the library contains the virtual machine's view of this process of status register. And we can, how do we get to this library? Well, we need to replace this roof instruction by something that doesn't trap into hypervisor, so jump to some fix up code, which does the emulation and returns. Or, we can replace this um, privileged instruction by an explicit trap. Just for a single instruction, this wouldn't buy you anything, right? This is whether you do an explicit trap or you trap implicitly by just executing a privileged state, it has more or less the same cost. Uh, it would help if for some reason your machine doesn't privilege this sensitive instruction, in which case that would be the only way to um, do the virtualization. Inserting an explicit trap, so-called hypercall, where the, the software now, the, the, the guest operating system now explicitly invokes the hypervisor. This works if you uh, can reduce the number of hypervisor entries. So the idea is if you do bulk operations, say on page tables, etc., then rather ex uh, virtualizing every instruction on its own, do one explicit trap into the hypervisor, pass the right arguments to um, instruct it to do some bulk operation and a return. And then they, that, that way save a lot of hypervisor entry and exits, or as it's also called mach machine exits and entries, um, and therefore make the whole virtualization more efficient. So. Both of these are ways to, on the one side, get around non-virtualizable hardware, or on the other hand, making things more efficient by either doing part of the virtualization completely in user level, and or doing it um, more high level. Bas basically, what a hypercall does is introduce a more high level abstraction, right? Instead of sort of um, copying a page instruction by instruction and trapping on each page table entry into the kernel, we could have a hypervisor operation that says copy this whole page table. And that would be a hypercore. So that's all fine and it's a clear winner in terms of performance. What's the obvious drawback? 
Um, yeah, everything introdu- can introduce bugs, obviously. <laughs> uh, no, what's, what's a even more obvious observation from here? How do we get from the left side to the right side? Well, you know, somehow we have to modify the guess, right? This can be done by explicitly compiling in these hypercores or by modifying the binary. So we no longer have this um, version of a virtual machine where you can take an unmodified guess and just run it there. We need to do something to it in order to improve the performance by using hypercores. So, and there's two ways to do that. One is modify the binary, as I said, and this is uh, a person who used to work at IBM and then later at VMware called it a heroic, um, I think he called it a heroic job of um, basically, find, you need to analyze the whole Windows or Linux kernel with a piece of software that identifies all these things where you need to insert hypercalls and do that efficiently without introducing bugs, etc. Obviously, the um, potential for new bugs are, are astronomic there. Um, VMware, this is what they, what really made them big, is using binary translation on unmodified guest OSs to do this hyper calls and thereby improve performance. Or the other way is by, yeah, changing the abstraction, basically moving from the plain ISA interface to a higher level abstraction that has these explicit uh, hypercalls in there. And um, this is what Zen used to do a lot. These days we have better hardware support, so it's much less of an issue. Okay, so now having sort of looked at the principles, let's look at some of the more concrete um, mechanics for doing virtualization. There's a, a, a lot of interesting aspects there. So one is virtual address translation. So this is a typical, fairly abstracted, obviously, view of how address translation or ad memory virtualization works. We have virtual memory, we have a page table that maps virtual memory onto a physical memory, and there is multiple processes, each has its own view of virtual memory and therefore its own page table. So every process has its own mapping from virtual to physical addresses, right? You're all totally familiar with that. Now, if you have a virtual machine, then what looks to as virtual memory to the guest operating system, which is of course what controls these page tables, is no longer actually virtual memory. Virtual memory is a level of abstraction down. We have a hypervisor in between. So we now have in between what's generally referred to as guest physical memory. So it's no longer physical, but it's what the hypervisor pretends to the guest to be physical. And that means we now have a two-stage mapping from virtual to physical addresses. We have the normal guest operating system page tables that map per application, per user address space, virtual addresses onto guest physical memory. And then we have the hypervisors page table that map guest physical memory to actual physical memory. And the whole point of virtualization is that we have multiple of these um, virtual machines and therefore multiple versions of guest virtual memory and each has a page table. If you just look at the middle to bottom layer, this looks again pretty much like the upper bit, right? It's a virtualization of memory, in this case by the hypervisor. And so, but on a, on, in a virtualized environment, you have both of them. So, how does this work? Because we only have one MMU in general. And of course, when the guest, uh, when the application is accessing virtual memory, it really needs to refer to something that lives in physical memory. It's, that's where the data is. The data is not in guest physical, it's in physical memory. So somehow we need to have this two level address translation, but we only have one MMU to do it. And, um, it needs to be somehow described by a single page table because that's where the MMU gets its mapping from. And there's two basic approaches to do that. The one is called shadow page table. So in a 
shadow page table, we have, this is a different view of the same thing. We have a user that executes instructions that access virtual, issue virtual addresses that meant to access data in physical memory. And then the guest has its notion of a page table with a page table pointer that determines where the page table starts. So this is now a virtual page table pointer virtualized by the hypervisor. And then we have the hypervisor, which has its page table that maps guest virtual to phys guest physical to physical. And what we need for the MMU is a page table that represents the combined mapping. And um, the guest, the shadow page table is one way to do that. So here, the hypervisor maintains another version of a page table or really one per virtual machine that is the combined combination of those mappings so each entry in that um, shadow page table each entry in the shadow page table represents a combi a sequence of two mappings from guest virtual to guest physical and from there to physical and how does the hypervisor construct that? But basically, by trapping all accesses or all modifications the guest does to its page table, it needs to trap those. And then the guest page the guest writes, say, if a mapping from a virtual to a physical address in there, um, it needs to insert that mapping into the shadow page table, but with a real physical address, not the guest virtual, the guest physical address which the guest operating system uses. So that, as you can imagine, is not necessarily cheap because you trap into the hypervisor whenever the guest modifies its page tables. It is, you can achieve a degree of efficiency by the observation that this thing um, this guest, uh, sorry, the hypervisor shadow page table has what's called TLB semantics. It is like a TLB in the sense that it doesn't always have to be completely coherent with memory. We talked about that yesterday when I talked about um, what the TLB, when, when you need to keep the TLB coherent with memory or not. And I discussed that, for example, if you just add a mapping to the page table, that doesn't affect, it needs to affect this TLB immediately. Eventually, the process will issue an address in that page that's not mapped in the TLB, and then the hardware will just reload it. So it's normal that the TLB is only partially consistent with memory. Obviously, if you remove a mapping from the page table, then you need to make sure that it's removed from the TLB as well. So in that case, you need to ensure coherence. So the TLB has some loose coherence with the page table, and this thing has exactly the same semantics. So it's basically a virtual TLB. So what the that's one way to look at it is that the guest operates on a page table that gets interpreted by an MMU that maintains a cache and a TLB, while this shadow page table is basically a software TLB maintained by the hypervisor. Um, and how does this work? So we have a user, oh, well, we have the hypervisor. The first thing it does is it write protects the guest page table. Why? So it, it can intercept attempts by the guest to write to it. So then the guest tries to add a mapping to this page table because it's write protected that tracks in the hypervisor. The hypervisor does the emulation, updates the shadow page table. Well, it doesn't actually need to update it at this stage, and this is where the TLB semantics comes in. It doesn't keep have to keep the shadow page table coherent with the user page table at this point. Because like in the page table versus TLB, the user only or the guest only added a mapping to the page table. So our Hypervisor page table, which as I said, is basically a virtual TLB, doesn't need to be updated at this stage. But what the hypervisor does, it needs to mark this particular guest page table as dirty, so it can fix it up later. And then it lets 
returns back to the guest OS and the guest can add more mappings, etc. keep on um, modifying that page table and then eventually it's done and wants to return to the user, which of course means it traps into the hypervisor again. And now the hypervisor needs to do cleanup and can synchronize its page table, the software TOB, with the user's view of the page table at that point. So it updates the shadow page table, right protects the um, guest page table again, marks it as clean, and then returns back to the guest and returns to the user. Okay? So you can see how this can be a significant efficiency gain when the guest does multiple updates to a page table, for example, when creating a new process. Um, if the um, guest does um, invalidates a mapping, then of course we need to make sure that anything is um, that the, the the software TLB or the virtual TLB is updated as soon as um, this mapping can be used. So again, it invalidates a mapping, traps into the hypervisor, same process before, marks it dirty. It can still invalidate more mappings. Again, the hypervisor hasn't yet a need to update the virtual page table and then eventually returns. It does a flush TLB. Now the TLB flush, that's the signal to the hypervisor that we now need to ensure coherence, right? This is basically why does the guest flush the TLB because it knows it's incoherent with the page table. It needs to force coherence by flushing the TLB. And that is now the signal for the hypervisor, ah, okay, now we need to make sure that this uh, shadow page table is coherent with the, our virtual page table, with a, um, with a guest page table. And so it does the TLB flush as well, of course, and then returns, okay? Um, and then, sorry, we started five minutes later, so I'll keep it going for a couple more minutes. Um, the alternative version of this is to actually expose the real page table to the guest. So in this case here, we have, again, the guest page table and the hypervisor page table. And we have the actual page table, which lives in the hypervisor. Um, but we let the guest actually see the real page table. But that means that it's okay, we don't need to uh, maintain a separate page table, but we then need to intercept whenever the guest reads or writes from the page table. Again, the, the write was as before, we needed to intercept that. But we now need to intercept the read again because the page table, the proper page table, contains different information from the virtual page table, the guest page table. In particular, it contains real physical addresses rather than guest physical addresses. Um, and so that means, yes, this is potentially less efficient because we now need to intercept not only writes but also reads to the guest page table. But the advantage is this can be wrapped up in um, in stops, in wrappers, where the um, basically the guest needs to follow the convention that rather than accessing the page table directly with load and store instructions, it does it through some wrapper functions which do the translation and thereby regain performance. And this is what um, Linux does, for example, um, where they hit the the guest now needs to know that its page table is virtualized and you hide that into it in these wrappers. So this is a, a, another case of para-virtualization, changing the hardware software interface by not operating, having the guest not operate directly on the page table with load and store instructions, but using these wrappers provided by the system. And Linux does this throughout these days. And this is how, how, what Zen originally used. Okay. This is a good point to have a break. So, one thing I alluded to that before already is self-virtualization, where basically you don't trap in the kernel, but you emulate things at user state. And um, uh, 
An example is the process status register, which is something that, that's just a simple work and that really provides a interface between the, the software and the hardware in sense of telling the hardware what kind of operations it should be doing or not. So in particular, it contains the processor mode, but also interrupt mask, etc. Now, what your guest thinks of an interrupt mask has nothing to do with the system's interrupt mask. It just means whether it's ready to receive interrupts. And of course, that's something which you can tell the um, the hypervisor either by letting the hypervisor emulate that completely internally or by having a contract between the guest and the hypervisor saying this is the place in my address space where this virtual processor status register lives and then the hypervisor can interpret that so basically the guest sets the interrupt mask for example or interrupt enable bit and or interrupt disable bit and at that stage, there's nothing to do for the hypervisor. So there's need, no need to trap into the hypervisor. It's only when the hypervisor then receives an interrupt, then it needs to look at, does the guest have its interrupt, its virtual interrupt flag, enable flag set or not? And if it's set, then okay, it, the hypervisor injects the interrupt into the guest. And otherwise it waits until the, hype, um, the guest modifies that. Right, so you get um, significant improvement of performance. Um, and I jumped ahead. So, next topic is how do you do with I deal with I/O, and of course that means how do you virtualize devices. And there's three basic models for that. We can have a complete device emulation model a what's called a split driver model or power virtualized driver model or path through and i'll look at them in turn so the device emulation mode is this is just basic trap and emulate um, virtualization so the device driver communicates with the device by reading and writing device registers as you're well aware of and if we do the complete emulation here that that means, okay, we intercept each of these um, de device register accesses. How do we do that? How do we make sure that we intercept any access to a device register by the guest? Uh, memory, memory, but, uh, yeah, we just keep the memory unmapped. And that forces every device register access uh, to trap into the hypervisor and the hypervisor can emulate it. And as you mentioned, this is a pretty high overhead way of doing it. The advantage is, yes, you can run native device drivers. You can just, this in principle, from a pure functional point of view, this sort of means, okay, you can use an unmodified device driver binary, which is of course part of having an unmodified guest binary. Um, it's pretty costly way of doing it. What other problem could you have? Um, no, I mean, you basically get for every device register, load or store, you get a trap, yeah? That's the cost argument. But there's actually a reason why functionally this may not actually work. Why is that? That's to do with timing. It's timing, yeah, of course. You can't, you can't really virtualize time when you talk to a device, which is the physical world, right? And these devices, they tend to have um, protocols of interacting with them which have time parts in there. So, for example, the, the device may specify that you write to this register and then wait for 10 microseconds and then read from the other Mac register or something like that. Now, these timings are, of course, all going to be massively off when you do this trap and emulate um, emulation and your device driver may not actually work anymore. Typically, extending the latency is not always a, a 
a real problem if you whether you wait five microseconds or 50 microseconds the device is likely to still produce the same result but there's cases where it just may not work in practice it probably still works why is that at least potentially but the, typically the operating system like Linux they have some self calibration because they don't want to be too hardware dependent so they do some calibration operations that say oh, how long does a load and store take etc on this hardware and this may be sort of the saving grace for the binary for the for the complete device driver virtualization and it, it may still because the operating system may just see a, basically a, um, a a much slower passing or faster passing of virtual time really and therefore fix this up but there's no guarantee in part in general for more complex device this is likely to cause problems besides the point that it's um, fairly inefficient so the alternative is to again change the abstraction level so we now have the proper device driver in the virtual machine and we have a virtual device driver in the guest operating system and they communicate via a different protocol rather than sort of a byte by byte device register protocol they would have a more high level protocol where say if you talk if you have a network device then your virtual network interface would be a much more high level interface that says okay just hand me a pointer to a packet and I'll get it out to the device rather than accessing individual device registers and of course that's that makes it much more efficient so it's a, just another case of para virtualization where we use hyper calls rather than explicit um, byte or word wise accesses and thereby massively reduce the overhead drawback is uh, and, and adv another advantage is that the virtual driver can be pretty simple because the we can have a much more high level much simpler protocol between the virtual device driver and the virtual device so that simplifies the device driver the drawback is of course we have to write a new device driver which breaks binary compatibility it's less of an issue these days because operating systems these days are used to loading device drivers dynamically. They have some discovery protocol and then select the right device driver and load it. Um, so you can have a discovery protocol that says this is a virtualized device and here's the virtual device driver to do it, use it. Um, the drawback is that while well, we have operating systems like Windows and Linux that have a huge wealth of device drivers for any device under the sun, and we need to replicate all that in the virtual in the hypervisor. Now that's a huge cost, clearly. With the binary, with the complete um, virtualization, that wasn't an issue, except it doesn't necessarily work. So here, somehow, we have to beat by the bullet of getting all these device drivers ported into the hypervisor. Any idea how, how to mitigate that? Generic device drivers. Second. Just sort of generic device drivers for its device? Well, that's for the virtual device driver, yes, but the, the, the hypervisor needs to interface to the actual device, so it, it needs the real device driver. That's one way to do it, yes. Uh, that's a motivation for using something like KVM. So I'll get to that later. There's basically two main approaches, and that's one of them. Um, so we also talk about that as a para virtualized driver. And yes, Linux now has this standardized interface to virtual devices called Virtio. And that basically means, okay, you just write a Virtio driver. Virtio is basically an interface spec for virtual drivers, and then on the Linux side, you're covered. Still leaves you to, with a problem that the hypervisor needs to provide these devices. So one way to get around this is you, you somehow reuse the existing operating system device drivers, and that basically means you need to reuse the existing operating system. And one way to do it is what Zen uses calls their DOM0 or driver operating system, where you have a special virtual machine which is only used for providing device drivers. 
So DOM0 basically runs a Linux system with all the standard Linux device drivers. It contains the real device drivers and then provides a virtio interface to the what they call DOMU, the user virtual machines. And they have a protocol for talking uh, to the DOM0. And um, thereby you can, they're reusing Linux device drivers. They don't have to re-implement all the device drivers in the same hypervisor. The obvious drawback is you now have a huge trusted computing base, right? Part of the driver for virtualization is security. You get notionally strong isolation between virtual machines. Well, this all breaks down here because now you have a complete, this may be a very fairly lean virtual machine, but you have a complete Linux system with all its broken drivers in your trusted computing base with um, thousands and thousands of bugs in there that can be exploited. And th that's a clear weakness of this model because this complete Linux system is in your trusted computing base, like it or not. It's not just the hypervisor itself. The send hypervisor is not that big. It's 100 or 200,000 lines of code. It's still an order of so magnitude, so more than a microkernel, but it's way smaller than Linux, but it sort of doesn't matter because it imports all of Linux into its trusted computing base. Could you use that with SEO4 to run SEO4 on lots of hardware? Yeah, using SEO4 as a hypervisor is a real option. And as I said, I'll be getting to that later. Okay, and then the third model is pass-through. This means you actually leave the device driver in the guest operating system and give it direct access to the device. So basically you need to map the um, device memory directly into the guest operating system. This is obviously efficient. There's no virtualization overhead in there. The device, the native device driver just work, use works directly, operates directly on the device. What's the obvious drawback? You just let the guest do whatever it wants with the actual device. Yes. If this is a DMA-capable device, you give them the guest control over physical memory. So that's obviously a bad move. So what do we do about that? We somehow have to limit access to physical memory of the device. Do you know any sort of construct that does things like that? The MMU does things like that. So we have now, we get a new kind of MMU, the so-called IO MMU, which, is, which allows the hypervisor to restrict the I.O. device's access to physical memory. If you have an I.O. MMU and modern processors have these now, then you can do this safely. You then need to basically context switch your MMU when you do a world switch to a different virtual machine, just the way you um, context switch the real MMU when you do a process switch. Right? So this is fine. There's still a clear drawback of this model. Can't share the device. You can't share the device because you can only really give one um, guest access to this device driver because if you have multiple VMs with the same device driver trying to access the same device, the device will get pretty confused and will not operate as intended. And this is where there's new hardware support now in uh, the form of what's called self-virtualizing devices. So the devices actually understand virtual machines and have what's the, the standard here is called single root I.O. virtualization or SIOB, which where the actual device, it's typically used for network cards, provides several virtual device interfaces. Obviously, this is a limited resource. There are not going to be hundreds of those, maybe a, um, a half a dozen or a dozen or so. So there's still a resource management issue, but it does allow to share such a device between different virtual machines. Okay, so this is the first specific hardware support we encountered that manufacturers have um, provided. So it's not surprising given that virtualization has really taken off in the last 10, 15 years, that hardware vendors now sort of coming to the party and providing improved support for this because it's really important for the overall business model. So I and IOMMUs is one of them, it's not the first one. <coughs> 
Um, the more important one is what's called, what Intel did at first with a thing called VTX, um, which is basically providing a new processor mode for ha having to be depend less on trap and emulate. So Intel had the additional problem that their machine was actually not trap and emulate virtualizable, so you couldn't actually do complete virtualization. You had to use tricks like VMware's binary rewriting or power virtualization. Um, but also, even if you do them, there's a high performance overhead. So Intel then came up with um, what they called VTX for making this more efficient. And what they did is, this is the traditional view of Intel protection rings. So you have ring 03, which is user, ring 0, which is kernel, and the ones in between are not used in practice. And they provided a separate version of that. The original thing is called root mode, which behaves like a traditional x86 box. And the new one is called non-root mode. So there is a new mode bit in the processor that tells you whether you're in root mode or non-root mode. And that's where you run the guest in. So the hypervisor runs in root mode, basically ring zero root mode. The others is mostly unused. And the guest kernel runs in ring zero non-root and um, application in ring three. And that means now this behaves completely normally until you have a um, trap that gets, needs to be handled by the hypervisor. So an application trapping into the kernel does a normal kernel entry, no hypervisor involved, until the hypervisor needs to be involved, which in Intel terms is called a VM exit. So that traps then into the hypervisor and the hypervisor can do whatever it needs to. But the whole point is, um, this is constructed in a way that VM exits are much less needed than before because this thing has its own machine, virtual machine privilege state which the guest operating system can freely operate on. So most operations on privilege state no longer need a trap into the hypervisor, they can just autonomously done by the guest operating system. For example, messing with its process status word, etc. And ARM has something similar. They had already um, two different execution modes called normal world and secure world. And it seems obvious that you, oh, let's just extend secure world into proper hypervisor mode, which they did in their first version of their draft hypervisor extensions and I thought it was really well done and cool etc and then people came and complained now we're using secure world for other stuff and we don't really want it and so they introduced a new mode underneath kernel mode in their normal world so they now have four execution levels rather than three before and I now actually need to split one of these up as again etc um, but on a very high level view, this is sort of similar to Intel in the sense that you have an orthogonal mode which tells you whether, uh, no, it's actually not. Um, the, the secure versus hypervisor was a bit more like Intel virtualization support, but they put just in this normal world an extra hypervisor mode in there as a super privileged mode, more privileged than the kernel mode. So, but the basic story idea is still the same. You can keep your native guest OS binary running in privileged mode and therefore avoid most of the traps and then have a more privileged hypervisor underneath. Um, I could rant on and on about what they did with secure versus normal world, but I'll skip that. Another extensions we have in ARM is configurable traps. So the idea is um, normally when you have a trap, you trap into most privileged mode, right? With the hypervisor now, there's a question, well, should a particular trap go to, all the way to the hypervisor or just to the guest operating system? And their extension, if you don't have that, you would have to send everything to the hypervisor because the hypervisor may need to intercept it. So instead, they allow you to configure traps whether they go to the hypervisor or the guest. And that means most system calls can just be handled by the guest without hypervisor interference. And so obviously that's a big performance boost. And um, Intel has something similar. Another interesting extension in ARM 
is directly geared to support instruction emulation. So imagine you have this set up. So you have um, your guest doing a privileged operation like accessing the address space ID register. And so what happens is, of course, this is the cache hierarchy underneath. You have an L2 cache and a split L1 cache. And then you have your CPU registers. And the instruction obviously needs to, to get into the CPU. It has to go through the cache. So it's first in the L2 cache, and then it's in the L1i cache, because it's an instruction. It's in the i cache. And then it gets into the instruction fetch, gets it into the instruction register, and then the hardware interprets it. Right? This is the normal um, way the, the processor works. And then it finds, OK, this is a privileged instruction. You shouldn't be doing this. We need to trap. And that trap will invoke the hypervisor. And the hypervisor then needs to interpret that instruction, needs to look what did the guest attempt to do, and do the emu emulation accordingly. Right? So in terms of performance, what's the problem here? In order to operate on that instruction, the hypervisor needs to actually read it, right? It has to have it somewhere and look at different fields, in particular opcode and stuff like that. Where does it need to be for the hypervisor to be able to do that? The guest OS. Hmm? No, no. Um, I'm just talking about the hardware view here. Right? The guest OS. Huh? As in, in the L2 cache. Well, it, it needs to be in a general purpose register because that's what the instructions operate on. Okay? So how does it get into, say, this R2 register? It goes up through the data caches. It goes up through the data caches. It needs to go through the data cache, yes. So this is real. Your instruction is actually in a CPU register. It's the instruction register. It's also in the L1 cache, but it still will trigger a compulsory cache list because in order to access it as data, it needs to lo be loaded into a general purpose register, and that means it needs to be loaded from the L1 D cache. So it's already cached. It's already in register. It just happens to be the wrong register and the wrong cache. So we get a, if you think about completely unnecessary cache miss, just to put this thing into the right register. So this means this is obviously inefficient. And so, the, so what um, ARM does is it will actually make this available in a general purpose register without forcing it to go through the D cache and cause a miss and also partially decoded already. So it will extract the opcode, etc. So simplifying the job of the operating system of the hypervisor. So we avoid the R1 miss, we simplify the decode in, of the instruction and the hypervisor and can just do the emulation, which is typically pretty straightforward. So that's a potential performance uh, gain for the case where you actually have to do instruction emulation, trap and emulate instruction emulation. Uh, x86 doesn't have an equivalent, it would be too difficult to do in, in ARM has a much more regular instruction set and so it's really easy to decide which ones you want to do, etc. The next one is, that's a really important one, is support for page tables. I explained shadow page table and um, direct access to, guest access to the proper page table before. You obviously got away understanding this is pretty can be pretty inefficient can we do that more efficient and this is really one of the bottlenecks of or used to be one of the bottlenecks of um, virtualization so the hardware manufacturers understood that and again intel was first but arm has this introduced it right from the beginning with their virtualization architecture a direct support for two levels of page tables so it now has two page table pointers in the ISA. The one is the hypervisor page table pointer, and then the guest page table pointer is no longer a virtual pointer. It is an actual hardware supported register, which the guest can set to a point to its page table. And then the hardware walker, 
can just walk the original page table. So no need to modify or shadow the guest page tables. They directly expose the hardware. And when we have a TOB miss, the hardware page table walker will go to the first, to the guest page table register, walk the page table, then go to the um, second, to the hypervisor page table register, walk the page table, construct the combined mapping from guest virtual to actual physical and insert that into the TLB. So much less overhead for, um, no overhead for manipulating page tables because it's just the guest data structure anymore and potentially more efficient handling of page faults. However, there's a catch here. Where's the catch? Intel calls this EPTs, by the way, extended page tables. Think about the worst case behavior in terms of memory accesses. So before, we just had one page table, which the hardware walks when there's a TLB miss. For sake of argument, just think, go for 32-bit address space where we have a two-level page table. So. The hardware walker goes to the page directory, does a load. Of course, the page directory lives in virtual memory. This can cause a TLB miss, and then we get a nested page fault. And then eventually it will get that datum and then go to the leaf page table, which can is also in virtual memory, can also trigger another TLB miss and another page table walk. But then we are done. Now in this case, this can be happen in both page tables, right? So we can have two TLB misses on accessing the guest page table and another two TLB misses on accessing the hypervisor page table. So the worst case TLB misses really blow up, gross, um, it basically grows quadratically. You can mitigate that somewhat because the hypervisor address space tends to be much more compact. It just hands out big chunks of physical memory maps it to the guests so it can use larger page sizes for mapping those and maybe get away with a single level page table in the hypervisor for the 32-bit case so that reduces it then worst case to three but worst case you get much more TLB many more TLB loads as you get in the other case, um, TLB misses um, on a on a Primary team TLB miss, you can have many more secondary TLB misses which come from walking the page table in this street level address scheme. So there, in average, it's a win, but there is a potentially significant cost. Certainly the worst case is much worse, which we worry about if we're interested in real-time behavior. Um, but also the TLB now has to maintain many more mappings, right? Because the TLB needs to map the guest page tables, at least the critical, the hot pages in there, as well as the hypervisor page table. So the page table themselves consume much more TLB real estate than before. And remember at the end of yesterday's lecture, I talked about how the TLB can turn into a bottleneck because it's a very, very limited resource. This clearly makes it worse. And so this case is which are real world use cases where you have 50% TOB refill overhead, so half the processor time going just in TOB refills, they typically result on off that one. So, which means that there's cases where this two-stage address translation, which in average is a winner, can actually be a, a real source of overhead. Okay, and then um, final ARM virtualization extension is virtual interrupts. So interrupts are again something where the hypervisor gets involved because the interrupt gets raised into the highest, um, most privileged, it traps into the most privileged software layer, which is your hypervisor, and the hypervisor then has to hand it off to the guest, and the guest eventually has to acknowledge it, which needs another trap into the hypervisor to acknowledge the interrupt and then um, get back to the guest. So ARM has this virtual interrupt controller where basically it splits the interrupt controller into what's, what they call a CPU interface and the virtual CPU interface and, the, and a, a distributor 
So the idea is you have a distributor that where the interrupt gets triggered that determines which interface to, the, uh, to send it to. And um, initially it gets sent to the virtual, to the CPU interface, which taps into the hypervisor. And then the hypervisor re-triggers it in the guest by activating this virtual CPU interface, which is the guest view of the CPU interface for the device uh, for interrupts. But then the guest can acknowledge the interrupt directly in this virtual CPU interface, and that goes directly back to the distributor. So we, per interrupt, we have the number of hypervisor um, invocations by only requiring the hypervisor when the interrupt is triggered, but not when it's acknowledged. So that's, um, that's again, it's not revolutionary, but it's better than nothing. Would be nice to have to be able to redirect interrupts both ways um, directly to the guest. And that might make sense, right? Certain interrupts you may want, as long as the guest is operating, they should just go to the guest. Um, they haven't got that yet. So there's the new hardware. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in x86, for some technical reasons, that's not an issue. And then, oh, there's one more. There's the IOMMU, which I already discussed, right? The, um, in ARM, it's called the System MMU. In x86, or Intel at least, it's now in Intel, it's called VTD. AMD calls it an IOMMU. Um, they're all the same thing. So that's the basic idea is that you can allow the guest direct access to the device, um, including DMA capable devices, provided we have a, a way to restrict physical memory access to the DMA, and this is what your IOMMU does. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the key difference here is that ARM has done it fairly cleanly in the sense that the IOMMU looks like an I, a normal IMU. It has the same page table format. So you can actually use the same page tables, for example, which makes sense, right? Your IO device should not access more physical memory than the guest has access to. So you can just use the same page table. Um, the guest may want to restrict it further. Intel has a completely different page table format. It's the usual hacking in, hacky Intel thing, right? Uh, um, Whenever they do something, they put one more complication on their already overly complicated hardware, etc. They do that for a living. Uh, the problem with ARM is, theoretically, they have a clean model, but that's only a reference design because ARM does the CPU core IP and the system IP is up to their licensees and everyone does their own thing. And so the nice, beautiful model breaks down at that point. And sort of um, people like Samsung, for example, are notorious by having system MMUs that protect only a subset of devices. And um, for example, for us, it means they're almost useless because we can't really do like a network driver on top of the microkernel using the system MMU. Um, RISC-V also has virtualization extensions. They're at the moment in draft spec. And the present version is 0.6, and that uh, has changed recently. And uh, the model is similar to Intel. So they have, traditionally they have, or before they had user mode, supervisor mode, and machine mode, whereas machine mode is basically um, for firmware. Normally, so operating system runs in supervisor mode, user mode um, for applications, and they put another orthogonal mode besides it, not unlike x86, where you have now a virtual user mode and a virtual supervisor mode. And your guest operating system runs in virtual supervisor mode and the hypervisor runs in a proper supervisor mode. And it also has the ability to redirect traps and two-stage address um, translation, etc., and in injection of virtual interrupts. So pretty much what the others have, except it's not quite stable yet, it's in draft. And so, yeah, trap redirection means you, if the virtual supervisor mode generates a trap, you can, that normally goes to machine mode, you can redirect it to all supervisor mode and all that stuff. 
Oh, hold on. I'm on this slide. So, I forgot to drop an old slide here. So, what happens when we do an actual world switch? This is where the architectures are somewhat different. And again, you can see the Intel world. The Intel attitude is if there's a problem, we solve it in hardware. This is IP we can sell. They have no interest in sort of keeping things clean. They love adding instructions and um, obviously complicating the hardware all the time and making operating system developers' life harder, etc. Um, so their attitude is do as much pos as possible in hardware. And that is reflected in the fact that their virtual machine state, so this is the basically the virtual registers that um, look like privileged registers, etc. Um, or are completely hidden from the hypervisor and are as from the guest OS and are just used by the hypervisor to um, deal with the virtual machine, they're quite sizable. They add up to up to four kilobytes. So it's a fairly a fair amount of state. And when the a hyper, a, a VM exit happens, so that we trap into the hypervisor, then Intel hardware will save that complete state. And then um, when the hypervisor goes back into the virtual machine, it restores the complete state. Makes life easy in this case for the hypervisor because it can just access directly the saved virtual registers. It doesn't really need to worry about saving and restoring. It just keeps a virtual machine control block for each VM and the hard hypervisor, uh, the hardware does everything on its own. The problem is, what, what's the problem here? Save and load four kilobytes every time it wants to do something? Yes. So each time you trap in the hypervisor, the hardware saves this four kilobyte worth of state and then restores it. And you may not actually need that because you obviously need to save and restore the complete virtual machine context when you do a world switch. But you often trap into the hypervisor without actually triggering a world switch, You're just doing some emulation or the guest try to go outside the range of what it was allowed to do or something like that. In this case, the hardware did a lot of unnecessary work by just saving and restoring state that's not really needed to be saved and restored because we, we restore it back immediately. So ARM does, is, a more, is more minimalistic here. The hardware itself only saves a minimum amount of state, um, just enough to for the op, uh, hypervisor to operate independently and um, let the and be able to restore the virtual machine but then if we do a world switch then the hypervisor has to manually restore, save and restore the rest of the state but that's fine because then it's needed obviously if the hardware does the whole save and restore in one go it may be more efficient than if the hypervisor does it because it needs a lot of instructions etc but these things can all be pipelines so there's no not a huge performance gain even in the world switch case of um, doing it the intel way as opposed to the arm way but if you don't have a world switch then this is clearly a way higher overhead than the arm world and um, risk 5 does it similar to um, arm except at least in the present draft hypervisor um, instruction set architecture, its virtual machine state is even much smaller than the ARM case. It's only about um, 10 words or so. <clears throat> okay. And then just a few final topics. Hybrid hypervisors. Mentioned KVM before as one version of of reusing guest device drivers or established operating system device drivers. And I mentioned the Zen Domain Zero as an approach to do that, where they have a complete oper Linux operating system in one virtual machine, basically just to provide drivers. Um, KVM is an alternative approach to do something similar, where they just use the Linux kernel itself as the hypervisor. So they have a complete Linux kernel running in the root 
domain and the machine the, the VM exit traps into that Linux that operates as a hypervisor and they have a um, special kernel module loaded in there to do to understand the virtual machine relevant operation so they just extend the Linux kernel by a loadable kernel module that um, understands virtual machines the advantage is you can run a complete Linux system, all your root daemons, etc., and even native apps on top of KVM, and at the same time run virtual machines on it. What's the drawback? Security. Hmm? Security. Security. Yes, and be more specific. Uh, trusted computing base. It's a huge trusted computing base again, right? And this, in this case, it's arguably worse than in the um, Zen case. It, then they can at least sort of slim down the driver OS to just encapsulate drivers just for the devices that are actually available on this particular hardware, whereas this is just a complete Linux system. So it's sort of a quick and dirty thing, um, but from the security point of view, it's a nightmare. And I. For some reason, people call this a Type 2 hypervisor. It's complete bullshit. Uh, a Type 2 hypervisor runs on top of a guest operating system. This is because the virtualization stuff is hosted inside the Linux kernel, but it's the Linux kernel is the hypervisor. Right? There's nothing Type 2 about it. It's a Type 1. Um, I call it hybrid to somewhat distinguish it, but it's definitely not a Type 2. All right. So. Coming back, and remember, one of the present drivers for using virtualization is clouds. So, how do you use clouds typically? Yes, what, what do people use clouds for? Huh? You run to slice of computer time. Yeah, and what, what do you run on your cloud? Everything. Websites, <laughs> huh? Websites like machine learning. Web servers is typically what people do, or machine learning. Or something like that. So, what, if you think about sort of the general OS context, what sort of characterizes these uses of cloud virtual machines? Networking. Yeah, that sort of more what's inside the VM. Linux. As a guest, yes, and on top. They're just applications. Right? Yeah. But what kind? How many? What kind of applications? It's, often just a single it's typically just a single server, right? So we're back to the '50s, basically, where we have an operating system running a single application. That's really what's happening, which is sort of bizarre, right? You have this complete Linux stack underneath just to support one particular server. Um, so, well. <coughs> There's actually ways around this, right? Instead of running this whole Linux thing inside the virtual machine where most of the code does, not, does nothing, in particular, all the device drivers are useless and a lot of the other services are useless, um, why not slim down the operating system to something that really just provides the services? The operating system is no longer used for resource management. Remember, the operating system has really three purposes. The one is security. That's done by the virtual machine here, by the hypervisor. One is resource management. It's done by the hypervisor. There's no resources to manage because all of the virtual machine's resources are there just to support the application. And it provides some services, and that's all that's left. Now, you don't need to have a full-blown operating system to provide that services. So what people then do is they just co-locate it. They use a very stripped-down operating system that just provide services, no resource management, no security, because that's all not needed. And then you don't even need to run it at a different protection mode anymore. You can just run everything in kernel mode because there's no security implications because all you do is support one particular app. Now, this sounds very much like why people started using virtual machines in the 60s. Single user OS supporting one application at the time and then have a hypervisor switching between them. So history goes in circles sometimes. These things are called library operating systems and because people need to write papers and pretend they have invented new abstractions, there's other names for the same thing again, they call them unikernels and non-zero kernels or whatever, null kernels. Um, 
interesting proliferation of meaningless terminology, there are really library operating system, which is an apt term because it, the operating system is just now a library that's linked against the application. All the traditional operating system functionality, in particular security and resource management, is left to the hypervisor. And interestingly, about 15 years ago, I made this very tongue-in-cheek prediction that the, um, the version of Tannenbaum 10 years thence would be identical to the one at those days, just all instances of process replaced by virtual machine, because this is basically what you get here, right? We have a, well, our virtual machine is really just a process with an application and a library except it runs in a different execution mode. But we've gone full circle in a way. Um, the textbook looks quite different, so I wasn't quite right there. What else can you do with hypervisors? A lot. Um, and sort of the last 15 years have seen um, oodles and oodles of publications on cool stuff to do with hypervisors. Um, I recommend reading up on some of these. Um, what I, one I really liked was time traveling virtual machines where you can do de backward debugging, right? That's a dream of every debugger. You take a dump and then you move backwards in time. Um, they did that at the operating system level, so you can debug your OS with that, by basically taking checkpoints at regular intervals and then um, keeping um, a log of events since the last checkpoint. And then if you take a crash, then, well, you take that, you take the last checkpoint, replay the events until the point where you want to debug from, and then you can debug backwards by keeping an inverse, the, the inverse actions of these events, basically an, an undo log in database language. So, pretty cool. Um, Segvisor, which um, uses the hypervisor to protect kernel, guest kernel memory, so the idea is there, okay, you have all these control flow attacks that modify guest state. Well, let's make this write protected by the hypervisor and then um, get rid of that threat. Overshadow, which is actually a way to protect applications from a malicious OS. So this is finally, oh yeah, our OS is not really trustworthy, yet it can read everything we do. Um, how about we limit we prevent the OS from accessing user data because the OS needs to play with user state, obviously, right? It needs to page things in and out, etc. But it never really needs to look at user data except if you do an explicit system call where you pass a buffer to the operating system. But even then, the operating system shouldn't really look at the data in the buffer. It should just hand it to the device or the file system. So the operating system doesn't really need to look at user data. And Overshadow uses a hypervisor to basically um, protect, make, make inaccessible to the guest operating all of the user data. And then, of course, they have to be a bit careful dealing with I.O., et cetera, where the OS needs to at least handle pointers to user data and hand them to device drivers. And there's Turtles, which when I first saw it, I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool and it's utterly useless. <laughs> Um, recursive virtual machines. Turns out people are actually using it these days. Uh, so, and and the, the first version of Intel virtualization was not recursively virtualizable, and then people discovered really cool uses for recursive virtualization. So, run a hypervisor on the top of a hypervisor, virtualize the hypervisor itself, and um, then, well, okay, this is actually now taking off, and people are discovering use cases for it. Cloud eyes. Cloudvisor, which um, tries to protect against buggy sin and um, use remote attestation, all kind of tricks. And then there's containers, which, as I mentioned early in, is not really the same type of virtualization because it doesn't virtualize at the ISA level, but at the um, OS API level. Um, and people really use that because resource management in Linux is broken, so they need to fit it into containers, and many more. Uh, plenty of things happening there, and I will come back to the virtualization topic later on when I talk again about 
uh, microkernels and how to use them, etc. But so this is basically the, the minimum background you need about virtualization, and I hope it will help you understand what's going on in this space. Any questions? So with uh, like the the reason why these cloud services and stuff is the the old fashioned model with the virtual machines, like going back to the fifties, like you said. Uh, yeah. If if operating systems did a proper job at security and resource management, that wouldn't be necessary. So but people have basically admitted defeat there. Uh, so could you have like a AWS kind of thing with uh, instead of virtual machines, like SEL4? Yeah. 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 Then um, I mean, SEL4 would be. In some ways, a really good platform for doing that because it does give you bulletproof um, isolation. It's not in its the present implementation is not going to scale to something like a, a, a serious cloud platform. Some of the implementation um, decisions are not made for that, but it could be scaled up. The main thing is, in order to deploy a hypervisor as on a real world cloud platform, you need a lot of management software. So when the Zen people did Zen, um, they spent most of their time not writing the Zen hypervisor, but providing all the management software you need to uh, deploy it in a real cloud environment. So that's where the real cost comes in. If you wanted to do that with SEO4, you would have to look for ways to reuse, reuse the, the Zen infrastructure, for example, which wouldn't be a bad thing, right? You'd have at least a secure hypervisor underneath. And, any other questions? All right, I can call it a day then.